When David fought Goliath, all he needed was the memory of a victory from God to slay the giant. Like a stone in the sling, it was a testament of every time that God had fought for him. You see, David fought a bear, and then it died, and then David fought a lion, and it died, and because of him knowing the faithfulness of his God, he was able to step up to the giant and say, I see you, I know you, in the same way the bear came down, and in the same way the lion came down, in the same way you're coming down. This is the Slaying Giants podcast. Hey friends, this is episode 5, Remove the Veil, and today's episode format is going to be a hair different than previous ones because we have a few different places in scripture that we need to talk about today. First, I want to thank everyone for coming back for another episode. This podcast is officially one month old. I didn't even know how to dream something so amazing into place, and I'm so, so thankful that God knows better than I could ever know, and he sees things that I don't see. And that is just, it's been such a blessing to me. First of all, the podcast has been such a blessing to me, period. Just like from what he's taught me through me trying to teach, I guess. Um, It's just, it's been a blessing. So thanks for coming back. Couldn't do it without you. Today, we're going to talk a bit about Moses. And I'm so excited because I feel like all of our episodes have been gearing up to this point. And I'm so hoping that this episode will be an encouragement for you and push you into pursuing the path that God has set apart just for you. If you don't know the story of Moses, first of all, recommend that you crack the Bible open and read his story because it is so amazing. And I know that the Lord is going to be leading us back to his story again and again to learn from, but... I'm going to give you a quick overview to catch you up to what we need to talk to, to talk about today. So Moses was a Hebrew boy. He was born into slavery. His family was born into slavery. And at the time that he was born, Pharaoh had just issued a new decree that all the Hebrew baby boys would be thrown into the Nile River to drown or be eaten by the wild animals like the crocodiles. This would include Moses, but Moses' mother hid him in uh, or she hid him for three months, and then she, when she couldn't hide him no longer, she made a basket, and she placed him inside, and she set him floating down the Nile to save his life. And I'm going to spare y'all from singing this song that I wrote about little Moses floating down the Nile, but I'm just going to tell you, my niece loves it. But anyway, Moses ends up at Pharaoh's palace, where he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, and Moses was no longer a slave. Before Moses could ever know the harshness of slavery, he found himself crowned as a prince of Egypt. Da, 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 da. Cue the Prince of Egypt soundtrack. Just joking. Though, if you haven't watched The Prince of Egypt, one, highly recommend. The art is the best art to come out of DreamWorks ever, in my opinion. That era of art for DreamWorks, like The Chef's Kiss. But two, the soundtrack is a masterpiece composed by Hans Zimmer. And I'm just saying, like, you know, if you like good cinematic soundtracks, like, this is it. Are there some minor and major inaccuracies in the Prince of Egypt movie? Eh, sure. But for the most part, 10 out of 10 movie. And just a wild fun fact for you guys. DreamWorks was working on the Prince of Egypt and the first Shrek movie at the same exact time. So the fact that the Prince of Egypt even made it to be a legitimate movie is a big deal, in my opinion. Because, I mean, those are two completely different movies. But anyway, so Moses grows up in Pharaoh's palace and in Egyptian culture until the day that he kills a man and he flees the country. There, Moses gets married and has a family. All the while, Pharaoh is still oppressing the Hebrew people. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush and called him to go free his people. Moses, after some back and forth with God, agrees to go to Pharaoh. And after some serious plagues on the Egyptian people, including the death of the firstborn sons, Pharaoh finally allows the Hebrews to leave Egypt. Then Pharaoh changes his mind because he's like, whoa, just let, I just let all of like the free workforce of this country go. Maybe that wasn't a great idea on my part. I don't know. Like, you know, um, he's like, that was a poor decision on my part. I was just grieving the loss of my son, but it's fine. Um, he changes his mind and he's like, 
I'm going to get all them slaves back here so they can build my towers and monuments and my pyramids. And he goes and he chases the Hebrews to the Red Sea. They were literally in between a rock and a hard place, LOL, you know, the sea and the Egyptian army. When God allows Moses to part the sea and the Hebrews walk across on dry land. And the Egyptians are like, if they're going across the sea, we're going across the sea. Not just, wow, this sea's been parted, but you know, whatever. That's That'd be what I was thinking. But no, they're just charging into the sea to chase after the, the Hebrews. And God closes the, the sea back and all the Egyptians are drowned. I mean, great story, right? You know, that's one of my favorite stories to tell is when God smote all the Egyptians. But, you know, if that ain't your thing, you know, I get it. So, while the Hebrews were in the desert, you know, just moving just moving forward casually here. While they were in the desert, God gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock. And then Moses went up on the mountain where God hand wrote the Ten Commandments into stone and gave them to Moses. When Moses came down off the mountain, the Hebrews, or the Israelites, as I'm going to call them through the rest of the story, were worshiping a golden calf. Like, good grief with these people. You know what I mean? Like, he just parted the ocean. Now they're wor- they're worshiping a cow. I don't know. I don't get it. I mean, I do. And that's a whole nother episode, so I'm not going to go into it. But, like, it's it's a whole thing. So, Moses is so upset about what's going on, I mean, legitimately, that he throws the stones with the Ten Commandments on them, and they broke. So, Moses had to go back up on the mountain. And this is where our story starts today. And I know what you're thinking, like, Emily, you could have, like, talked about 72 different things and you've just literally skipped over them. So, like, what could you have left to talk about? Well, guess what? I know that that's true, but I think that what God has for us today is going to connect with everything we've talked about in the last few weeks. And what I'm saying is, is I feel like we're talking about, like, a more obscure Bible story that a lot of people, like, don't talk about a lot. So I'm super excited about this. So our first bit of scripture takes place in Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 through 23. We'll be using the ESV today, but again, follow along in the translation that you like best. And the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And I didn't intend to start with this section of scripture, but when I was getting into the meat of what God has for us today, I just kept coming back to that prayer of Moses where he said, please show me your glory. Like, that is one of my favorite prayers in the whole Bible. But y'all, at this point, Moses has spent more one-on-one time with God than any other person in the Bible besides Adam and Eve who were in the garden with God. Yet, Moses still desires more of God. God spoke to him through a burning bush. He allowed Moses to be a mouthpiece for him to Pharaoh. He gave Moses the instructions for the first Passover. He opened the sea and allowed them to walk on dry ground. He supplied water from a rock and sent bread from heaven. He gave Moses tablets of stone where he hand wrote the laws for his people. But Moses wanted to go deeper still. He wanted to find God's heart. And after he secured the restoration of favor for his people, he asked for it. And God responded in the best way that he could for Moses on this earth. He tells Moses to cut two more stones like the ones that he just broke and to come back tomorrow. When Moses returns, God fulfills Moses' deepest desire just as he promised he would do. And we find that in Exodus 34 verses 5 through 10. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. 
and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation? And Moses quickly bowed his head to the earth and worshipped. And he said, Now I have found favor. If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin. And take us for your inheritance. And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom are, among whom you are, shall seek the word of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Y'all, whoa, oh gosh. This is some of my favorite Bible, like right here in Exodus. This is some of my favorite bit of Bible. The Lord proclaimed his goodness to Moses. He revealed his character to Moses on that mountain. He didn't lecture Moses. Instead, God allowed for him to experience his character for himself. He tucked Moses into a safe place on the mountain, covered him with his hand to protect him, and then he passed by and allowed Moses to see his back, the very most that Moses' eyes could have even stood to look at. And then Moses is so moved to his core and spirit by this revelation of God that the first thing that he could think to do is bow to the ground and worship. And he said, If I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, go among us. We don't deserve it. We're stiff-necked, but pardon our iniquity and our sin. When we know that God is good, we should ask for God to be good to us. When we know him to be forgiving, we should ask for him to forgive us. Y'all, when we know him, when you know him who he truly is not who your parents say that he is not who your pastor says that he is not who I say that he is when you truly know God it will lead you to receive from him the very things that he is merciful gracious long suffering abounding in goodness and in truth keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin Y'all, if you want to know the heart of the Father, I'm begging you to open his word. It is a love letter, especially for you. It is the checklist of all the things your spirit desires inside of you. It is water to quench your thirsty soul. It is the treasure map to God's very heart. Like Moses, when we experience the very heart of God, we have a compelling urge within us to worship. And if we don't have that urge, it's clear evidence that we don't really appreciate who God is. And that one stings. Because aren't we all guilty of that? But when Moses finishes worshiping, God made a new covenant with Israel. He didn't twist their arm and force them to join. He didn't ask them how they felt about it. He didn't negotiate. He told Moses exactly what the covenant would be and what would be expected of the Israelites. He told exactly what his plan was to glorify himself to all the nations through Israel and to reveal his glory through the great things he did among and through them. And Israel had a choice. Either the great things would be blessings so great that every nation and people who saw and heard of them would know that there was truly a God and that his hand was on his people. Or the great things would be curses so horrible and so painful that every nation and people would know that God was punishing his people. Israel would experience both, and don't we also? Those of us who are born again can choose to follow and obey God's will and allow his blessings to flow out of us and through us like the water that gushed from that desert rock. Or we can choose to chase our own agendas and receive chastisement for our disobedience. Though, also like the Israelites, we found that God's grace always follows the chastisement. God goes on to give Moses some very clear expectations for his people. And 
Then we come to the part of scripture that God gave me in the first place for this episode. Exodus 34, verses 39, or 29 through 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin on his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the people of Israel that he was commanded. The people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining, and Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Moses went up on the mountain with God more than once. When Moses came down from the mountain this time, it was his second time with God. Both times, Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights in God's presence. Both times, Moses left the mountain with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. But this time, we see that something is very different about Moses. This time when Moses left the mountain, the Bible tells us that his face was shining. Not glowing, but shining. Like a light. The Hebrew verb for shone literally means shot forth beams. Like he was shining like a light. Like looking into a flashlight. And so, we must dive into what is different about the first time on the mountain compared to the second time on the mountain. And I believe that it's a simple, simple five-word prayer that Moses prayed on his second trip. Please show me your glory. It was only after Moses prayed the prayer. It was only after Moses pressed further into God's heart. It was only after Moses started swimming to the deep that God revealed himself to Moses. Moses was so focused on God that his face shone as a result. And Moses didn't even know it, but there was a transformation taking place on that mountain. There was a transformation taking place in Moses' heart. And it was so intense that it affected his outward appearance. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the Bible tells us that he didn't know that his face was shining from an encounter with God's glory. And you'd think he'd know, right? But Moses was a humble man. He knew that he didn't deserve God's grace. We literally just watched as he told God so on the mountain. He said we're stiff-necked, and he was talking about himself too. Charles Spurgeon had some amazing things to say about this very encounter with God. He said, I'm afraid, brethren, that God could not afford to make our faces shine. We should grow too proud. It needs a very meek and lowly spirit to bear the shinings of God. We are always praying, Lord, make my face to shine. But Moses never had such a wish. And therefore, when it did shine, he did not know it. He had not laid his plans for such an honor. Let us not set traps for personal reputations or even glance a thought that way. Moses didn't know, but the Israelites knew. They saw his face shining and they were afraid to come near him. And y'all, in all fairness, like they'd never seen somebody's face shine before. This was new territory for them. This was different. This was weird. And I've got something to tell you. that, And you're probably not going to like this, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. The closer you get to God, the weirder you become to other people. Moses called to them, and at the sound of his voice, Aaron and the other leaders came to him. And then afterwards, the rest of the Israelites drew near. Then Moses put on a veil. He put on the veil, and he would remove it in the presence of God and wear it in the presence of the Israelites, because this glory, this shining It was temporary. It was never meant to last. It's like when you have a glow stick. When you first break that glow stick and those chemical reactions happen inside, 
when the oxalate esters react with the hydrogen peroxide and then that mixes with the dye, um, it causes all the electrons to move to an excited state. And as they slowly begin to relax, it puts off light. And that glow stick glows, doesn't it? Like it's bright. But as time goes on, the light dims and dims until the electrons go back to their normal state and there's no light being put off. And that's what Moses was trying to ease the Israelites back into, that normal state. Because he knew the hearts of the Israelites were fickle and forgetful. They'd already said that it'd been better for them to be slaves in Egypt than to starve in the desert because they went one day without bread, apparently. I mean, same. I would probably, this would probably be me. This would be me out in the desert. I'd be out in the desert five minutes. I'd say, when are we going back inside? I mean, I get it. Like the same God that just hadn't parted the Red Sea wasn't going to feed them. You know what I mean? But it's fine. So Moses knew that when they saw that shine dimming from his face, that they would try to stray away from the Lord because they're like, well, Moses ain't got it anymore. Look at that. His face is done dimmed. He ain't even shining no more. Is the Lord even with him? Is the Lord with us? Is he going to feed us? Where's the manna? I'm telling you, the Israelites, they're, they're, they're a tough crowd. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> if anything, though, if there is ever a mirror for us, this is. In this story, I know that we desire to be Moses. I know that we want so badly to resonate with the one whose face shines. But again, we're the Israelites. Fickle and forgetful. Complaining. Returning to idols when things don't go our way. Jumping off the wagon when what we see doesn't line up with what we want to believe. And Moses, the humble man. The servant who went up on the mountain to plead the case of the Israelites. The man who offered himself up to appease God's wrath. The one whose face shone. Moses, dear friends, is the mirror for Jesus. And in fact, I'll save you a lot of time getting your red thread tangled and untangled because Moses is very, very rarely a mirror for us. Moses is most always the mirror for Jesus. And just like Moses, Jesus interceded on our behalf to the Father looking to destroy us or at least desert us. Just as Moses offered to lay down his own life to save the Israelites from God's wrath, so did Jesus lay down his life for us to save us from the very same thing. Just like Moses, Jesus seeks to, to lead us in ways and commandments of God so that his glory may be revealed to us and through us. And I have one more bit of scripture before we're finished today. It's going to be a shorter episode. Um, this is going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 18. And I really encourage you to go read all of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and really think about what Paul's saying because it's very relevant to us today. Um, but I'm just going to read verses 7 through 18 because he is reflecting directly to the story of Moses with the veil on, and it's a super important message. Um, starting in verse 7, Paul says, Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness should far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, 
To this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes the Lord, who is the Spirit. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Forgot that word, so sorry. Paul is talking about how the old covenant was never meant to be a permanent covenant. Only a predecessor for the new covenant that Jesus established. The new covenant in the law of the old is far more glorious. The old covenant was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant is written on our hearts. The old covenant is a letter of the law, while the new covenant is of the spirit. The letter brings death, but the spirit gives life. The old covenant brings condemnation. The new covenant brings righteousness. The old covenant had a glory that faded. The new covenant has a glory that remains and in fact so far surpasses it that the old covenant appears to have no glory by comparison. Moses' face shining is an example of the old covenant. Eventually the glory faded and his face stopped shining. He hid his face with a veil or he hid this fading from his face with a veil so the Israelites would not lose faith. Likewise, the glory of the old covenant is a fading glory, but the glory of the new covenant endures without failing. And y'all, this applies to us. At salvation, each of us receives a shining light. The old covenant was restrictive and separated sinful man from holy God. The light of the new covenant gives us a glorious hope. Because of this hope, we can come boldly to God. At salvation, God lifts the veils from our hearts, and we can see clearly how the new covenant Jesus made is the perfect covenant. No longer does God require us to break ourselves over laws that we as imperfect people can never uphold. Because of what Jesus did on the cross and the work, of the Holy, and the work that the Holy Spirit does in us through the new covenant, we can pursue a bold, liberated relationship with Christ. Because of this liberty, we can pursue a glorious, intimate relationship with God. And we must pursue God intentionally, seeking to find His heart. The more we seek Him, the more clearly His reflection and His heart becomes to us. We behold the glory of the Lord like through a mirror. In biblical times, mirrors were not as clear as they are to us now. I mean, we can look in the mirror right now and see every single imperfection. You know what I mean? We can look, we see all the hairs that are not in place. Um, We see any like zits and pimples that are popping up and you're like, where did that even come from? I didn't have that yesterday. Uh, You look in the mirror and you see like seven gray hair sprouting and you're like, definitely didn't have any of those yesterday. Um... We see all of our imperfections. We see our wonky noses or our one of our eyes that's slowly drooping. Um, we see every imperfection. But in biblical times, their mirrors were not as good as they, ours are. They were made out of polished metal, and they usually gave a cloudy or a fuzzy image. So if you think about that, we see the glory of the Lord... But we don't see the full picture of the glory of the Lord. It's fuzzy. It's not clear to us. But the more that we pursue him, the more we pray that five-worded prayer of Moses where he said, please let me see your glory, the more clearly the reflection becomes as God reveals himself to us. And like Moses on the mountain, when he reveals himself to us, we are transformed. God changes us from the inside out. He refines us. He burns away what we don't need. He prunes what is hindering our best growth. And pruning is so hard. Refinement is so hard. Because you're sitting here and you're watching God like cut back all these places where you're growing. And you're like, yeah, I'm growing. And God cuts it back. And you're like, why are you cutting this back? 
this is a place of growth. And God's like, no, it ain't. You think it is, but it's not. I need to cut it back so you can grow correctly because you're not growing correctly here. You think you are, but you're not. You need to trust me to prune where you're needing to be pruned. And I hate pruning season because it hurts. It's not comfortable. But God has to take us through that season to change us into the same image of himself. And this is where we have to be very careful that we're seeking God for ourselves and we are seeking his true character and we are seeking a personal relationship with God. Because when we don't seek God for ourselves and we just listen to what other people think, a lot of times we come out with a distorted or incorrect view of who God is. Because you can't just trust anybody's view of God. That is a fact for you guys. You cannot just listen to anybody and think that that is the truth about God. Because every single person that I have ever met has a different interpretation of God in some point or another. So you have to personally seek God out for yourself. And you have to make that relationship with Him. And you have to make it an intentional choice day by day to talk to Him, to read your Bible to grow that relationship like you would any relationship with any person that you have in, in your everyday life. Because when we have a distorted or incorrect view of who God is, that's how we grow. And that is the image that we transform into. And it's the, it, when it's the incorrect image that we're transforming into, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of pruning to unlearn those things that we've learned and to seek out God's true heart and grow correctly. So that's just trying to save you all just a little bit of hurt. Moses had to worry about the light dimming from his face, but because of the new covenant, we don't have to worry about our lots fading. I think back to that simple children's song, This Little Lot of Mine, I'm Gonna Let It Shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm going to let it shine. Y'all, the choice is yours. Are you going to let your light shine for all to see? Are you going to swim to the deep end and pursue a real and intimate relationship with God? Are you going to live your life for him and tell others of how good he's been to you? Or are you going to hide behind a veil and crucify yourself and others over the laws of the old covenant? You can't uphold them. You can't even hope to. The only thing that old covenant's going to do is leave you broken to break others. The choice is yours, sweet friend. Will you remove the veil? See you next time.